Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Dr. Johannes Goldman Madsen, an associate professor of swine nutrition at the University of Copenhagen. So Johannes, before we start, would you mind giving the audience a short introduction about yourself? Sure, and uh, thank you very much for having me on this uh, podcast. Yeah, I am. Uh... I have a master in animal science from the University of Copenhagen, and after that, I uh, took a PhD at ETH Zurich in Switzerland, working uh, at the Acroscope uh, in in the pig nutrition. And uh, following the, my degree there, I worked uh, two years in the industry with Evonik, and mainly working with the amino acids and probiotics. And then uh, following that, I went back to university working as an assistant professor uh, from 2019. And uh, yeah, I'm now, now still here working with uh, mainly uh, swine nutrition. Awesome. So while you're at the uh, University of Copenhagen, so let's talk about a little bit of the work you did there. So from what I read, it seems your areas of study tend to revolve around uh, growth rates of low birth weight pigs, um, some creep feeding and weaning transition studies. So what have some of your uh, latest studies shown? Yeah, so uh, currently I'm uh, working together with Associate Professor Silota M.D. Williams, also at the University of Copenhagen. And we have a PhD student, uh, Helena Sato, who is working on um, trying to uh, to see if we can find uh, an alternative rearing strategy for this low birth weight pigs from large litters. We have a fairly huge challenge with uh, with high mortality rates, and uh, especially these low birth weight piglets have impaired growth uh, performance compared with the larger litter mates. So what we're trying to do is uh, we are doing two things. We're trying to rear them as efficiently. So we're actually taking them really, really early, uh, day zero or day one after birth. And I must emphasize that it's not, it's not legal in, in practice, so it's only for research purposes. But it is to to see if it's actually possible to make, to make the, the piglets uh, survive and grow. And then on top of that, we have uh, tried also to optimize uh, milk replacement so it resembles more the sound milk, uh, especially with respect to uh, fat content and also protein content. Because normally it's uh, in the farrowing pens, you, you give the milk supplements, and of course they are in lower quality than the sound milk because it's only a supplement. But here we have we want the pickers to only get the, the milk replacer. So one uh, one of those that I looked at really quickly with the milk replacer, kind of like you mentioned, um, the since you started them from day zero, how does that affect them in terms of um, since they have less colostrum in t- intake? How does that affect them um, with their gut morphology and their intestinal health? Yeah. So in the the experiment where we took them already away day zero, we had actually milked out some colostrum, so we're sure to immunize them to the best of our uh, abilities. We are not sure that they actually got enough, and that's that's the one of the, yeah, the how do you say that's one of the the, the really downsides to 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 do that as a fissile rearing, and of course that will probably have a, a a negative effect. But on the other hand, it's is in the first three days after pairing that those small piglets are really in high risk of uh, of dying uh, due to especially uh, yeah uh, megafiltration but also uh, uh, hypothermia. Um, so that's why right. we try to turn a little bit around uh, to take the small ones away, uh, even though some studies have shown that it's better to take the last one away and then let the small ones remain with the sow. But they are very much at risk and due to uh, they have very low uh, glycogen depots when they are born, and they are very much in, in energy deficit. Um, but it's true that we need to consider also, especially the colostrum uh, uh, at the birth. And that's that where it's become very difficult. And other things we also realize is that there is so much we don't know about the the, the suckling piglet and its capacity to ingest uh, yeah feed, if you call sound milk uh, feed. Uh, so there's a lot of unknown territory here. We don't know, you know, how much dry matter can they actually ingest uh, at a certain time, and can they actually? Um, is it possible for them to digest so much uh, protein and fat when it's a libitum, or do we have to do it more restrictive as it is with the sow? That's something we're also looking into. But it's uh, yeah, it's it's quite new for us. So, with those studies, have you seen any? Um significant changes or differences with um, weaning weight with those low birth weight pigs when they've been switched to uh, sow milk or how does that look? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the, the positive thing is that, uh, yeah, we see it as a positive thing that we can actually have them survive. I mean, they can live in, you know, under artificial rearing conditions, but we cannot make them grow that fast. They are very small at day 21. And if we keep them to day 28, they will still be very small. So we still have to figure out how we can optimize the milk replacer. I mean, it's, it's probably not possible to do the same as the sow milk because there's also a lot of growth factors and other immunoglobulins and, and stuff like that, that you in theory could you immunize synthetically, but it will be, will be very difficult. So yeah, we're still looking into some things. We will try, uh, something new, uh, uh, yeah, next week, actually, I cannot say what it is, but, uh, I hope that's something that, um, that will make us come closer to the sound mode. I also saw that you looked, um, you've done a couple studies as well with, um, creep feeding around this weeding transition. Um, and one question I had in particular is because uh, obviously since in the U.S. it's not as popular to do creep feeding because they have the 21-day typical weaning age versus the mandated 28 days in Europe. Um, and so with that and with this milk replacer, um, do you think either of those strategies can uh, or still have a possibility to be economically beneficial in the U.S. even with the uh, um, lower weaning age? It seems like uh, that the uh, the liquid crypt feeding and also having liquid feed after the weaning uh, seems to positively positively affect uh, the growth performance uh, some weeks after uh, weaning actually, and and the the whole uh, crypt feed um, thing I mean it's both related to the, the the weaning making a smoother transition from sucking to weaning but also accommodating the the larger litters. So you could also, when you have the liquid feeding system, you can also switch between uh, the milk and, and, and liquid feeding. What we also looked into, if there was a difference between dry feed, dry trip feed and liquid crit feed, if that had an impact. Uh, and then we, we tried to look a little bit deeper on the, um, the carbohydrates activities to see if that was uh, an, a marker for uh, gut maturation. We didn't see anything really clear, but it, it, it was clear that the, the pigs fed the liquid um, crib feed and also liquid feed afterwards um, seemed to have a positive effect. And and one of the experiments, uh, we haven't published it, but we did together with the Sigis Innovation uh, in Denmark, where they've made quite a large uh, study. Awesome. So you mentioned it a little bit, um, and some of it sounds a little confidential. Um, but do you know, um, or can you share some things about what the next steps for your team will be in terms of um, research or what you plan to look at later? Yeah, we will still try to optimize the milk replacer uh, with, with some new ingredients uh, to see if we can uh, make them have uh, faster growth. So we will repeat the study. We will take them away day, day one, and then we will, uh, we have two groups, one control and one with the treatment. Then we will actually feed them individually and to see if we can make them grow a little bit faster. Uh, what we also will do is that we will try to to have them, uh, to feed them uh, every uh, one hour, not every second hour, but we are a little bit careful because they they seem to not digest and ingest uh, to the same capacity as when they are with the sow. So that's, yeah, we're still a little bit careful. Gotcha. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show and sharing this with, uh, with us. And when you um, do manage to get further into this research. Uh, feel free to reach out to us again because I'd love to hear more of it. Um, but to everyone else listening, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed this episode and we are constantly on the lookout for the latest updates in swine nutrition. And if you have a swine nutrition related research trial that you would be able to share on our podcast, please send an email to nutritionblackbelt at swineit.com and we would love to talk about your research. See you later.